Uh, hello, good evening. Um, my name is Siobhan Carroll. Um, I programme the events here at Nottingham Contemporary. Um, I'd just like to welcome you to this evening's talk by Dr Alex Vesidovan. Um, this evening, Alex will discuss the spatial politics of the famous squatting movement in Berlin, um, for which Klaus Weber, who, um, whose work we're exhibiting upstairs, was an active part of, and something which I believe shaped his attitude and interests to still today and still can be shown in the work upstairs. Um, I'll just briefly introduce Dr. Vasudevan, who is a lecturer in cultural and historical geography in the Faculty of Social Sciences at the University of Nottingham. Um, his research focuses on radical politics in Germany and wider geographies of neoliberal globalisation. Alex is um, currently working in a on a book project that explores the historical and political geographies of the theme of t tonight's um, talk, um, which actually I think has been published in 2011. Um, Alex has contributed to The Guardian a couple of times in the past month, um, and I think his talk this evening is quite topical um, in, in the context of what the housing ministers are wanting to, to um, pass in our, in our parliament at the moment. Um, this even, event uh, this evening is part of an extensive programme of events, performances that have been programmed alongside the Klaus Weber exhibition. Um, we'll be host welcoming a host of speakers, including the Darwin expert, Connor Cunningham from Nottingham University. Katie Barrett will be here to discuss the selections of work that are upstairs in the group exhibition already there in relation to conventional museum practices. Um, plus, this weekend, we will be having a large installation in this space by the um, Nottingham-based artist Caroline Locke, and there'll be a live musical performance with her sound fountains on Saturday evening. And um, we'll also be having a performance in the galleries at the beginning of December alongside uh, Klaus's tritone by the band Surfacing, which um, David Bell, who's a local academic as well, is part of. Um, so I hope you enjoy this evening's event and I hope to welcome you again to some of the other events that we have the rest of the season. I'd just like to hand over to Alex. Right. Um, thank you, Siobhan, and I'd also like to extend a thanks to uh, Nottingham Contemporary for inviting me to speak this evening. Um, what I propose to do in, in my talk this evening is really provide a kind of, of context or framework for perhaps beginning to understand um, Klaus Weber's working practice. So while I might not speak to it directly, I hope providing you a kind of story about the squatting scene in Berlin will provide a flavor of maybe some of the issues that are also at stake in, in Weber's practice, and I will try to flag that up uh, in a few points um, this evening. Um, by way of uh, a detour, however, I wanted to begin this um, evening by drawing attention to a campaign that's going on as we speak, and this is something I don't usually do in talks, but it is a, of a kind of pressing political moment that we are uh, living through right now, and it has to do with an attempt by the current government to criminalize uh, um, squatting in residential properties in the UK. They launched a consultation period this summer, which some of you may be familiar with, um, and as a result of that consultation period, have decided to tag a rather dubious um, clause to a legal aid um, uh, bill which is currently going through the House of Lords. Um, and this was despite the attempts by a number of, of homeless charities and other um, groups um, to petition against precisely this, this legislation, including one group called Squash, Squatters Action for Secure Homes. And I only draw attention just to draw, uh, give you a flavor of what is at stake here, is that um, the table that you see uh, to my left is a table documenting the responses received by the government, of which there were 2,200. 2,126 of them were, for, as you can see, from members of the public concerned about the impact of criminalizing squatting. Only 10 were from victims of squatting, uh, um, and only 25 from members of the public concerned about the harm squatting can cause. Nevertheless, Despite um, this particular um, uh, consultation period, the government has decided to do precisely what uh, the table would suggest they ought not to do, which is to criminalize squatting in residential properties. And this is currently going through the House of Lords, but there's still 
time to sort of petition MPs and Lords with this in mind, and so I only draw attention to it because I think this speaks to some of the wider issues that I was recently writing about in The Guardian about not only squatting but occupations and the right to protest. And I think these are issues that will become of a kind of, um, well, are incredibly germane, if you like, for the cu current moment that we're living through, not only here in the UK, but uh, within a global context as well. So sorry, that was just a bit of a detour, um, but I thought it was an incredibly important context in which this presentation is situated. Now, the modest purpose of this evening's talk is really to provide some contextual observations pertaining to the show upstairs. Now, Klaus Weber was for a time a squatter in Berlin in the early 1990s when he was a student at the Hochschule der Künste, as were a number of other students at the school at the same time. And the main aim of this evening's talk is to tell a story, uh, a very simple but also in other respects complicated story about the development of the squatting scene in Berlin from the late 1960s to the present. And I don't mean to suggest that squatting was a direct um, influence on Weber's practice, but I do want to sketch something of the creative milieu out of which he emerged and perhaps draw some conclusions about notions of influence and so on. Now, the, the research for this presentation, as Siobhan already pointed out, is derived from a, a larger project, a book-length project, that explores the historical development of the squatting movement in Berlin. And I've spent the last couple of uh, years conducting detailed archival, but also ethnographic research in Berlin, but also elsewhere in Germany as well. And at the center of that project is a concern with radical politics and the development of more just and equal spaces in our cities. And that project really begins to chart, I hope, the everyday practices and the political imaginaries of squatters and examines the composition and assembling of alternative collective spaces in the city, with a particular focus in this instance on Berlin. And while squatting in this respect attracted those who wished to pr protest the lack of affordable housing, rampant property speculation, and the negative effects of post-war urban development, the squat, if you like, was also seen as a place of collective world-making, a place to imagine alternative worlds, to express anger and solidarity, to explore new identities and different intimacies, to experience and share new feelings, and to defy authority and live autonom autonomously. So squatting offered an opportunity to quite literally build an alternative habitus, where the very practice, the very idea of occupation became the basis for producing some kind of common space, a space where principles and practices of cooperative living um, intersected with juggled political commitments, emotional attachments, as well as the mundane materialisms of domesticity, self-governance, and renovation. And I think what the book will hopefully show is that the practice of squatting was, was both a necessary protest against precarity, against housing precarity in particular, but also a protest for alternative ways of living together in increasingly divided and unequal urban settings. Um, and yet to remain alert in this respect um, to these really micro practices of squatting um, is not only to dwell on the everyday, but one of the things I really want to do in the book is also to connect up these registers with wider debates about the practice of urban politics and the emancipatory possibilities of architecture of the built form. So my working argument really is a deceptively simple one. Um, what I want to suggest, and this is something that kind of runs through this evening's talk, is that squatting should be seen as the political other to creative destruction, and that we find in the various lives, the spaces and practices of squatters, an alternative urbanism that grows ever more necessary and urgent in the face of capitalist urbanization. And what I want to do in the remainder of this talk is really move through a discussion of the historical development of the German Hausbesetzerbewegung, uh, the German squatter movement, from the prehistory of the scene to its eventual fragmentation in the 1990s. So the main section of this, uh, of this talk is really entitled Squatting the City, which tracks that history. But I also want to draw specific attention to the role that the built form has come to play, so the role that architecture has come to play in the everyday practices of squatting. And I want to end um, the talk with an examination of one squat in East Berlin, K77, um, that has become a kind of legal experiment in architectural activism. And many of the people involved in that particular squat were also students um, at the Hochschule der Künste when Weber was a student himself. And this was the kind of milieu he was involved with. And I think, I hope, perhaps, that that um, case study will raise wider questions about the, the reinvention or the, the fabrication of common spaces in the contemporary city. So that's really what I want to do this evening. Now, 
The recent, sorry, I'll move back for a sec. The recent historical geography of squatting in West Germany does not actually have its origins in Berlin, but rather in Frankfurt, where on the 19th of September 1970, an abandoned Jugendstil apartment on Epsteinerstrasse in the city's West End was reoccupied. Houses on Liebigstrasse and Corneliusstrasse soon followed. There were, moreover, this particular slide shows, vibrant, fully formed scenes across West Germany. Now, it was ultimately, however, despite these, these scenes, West Berlin that really came to occupy a privileged position within the scene. As Belinda Davis has recently noted, the spectrum of new left activism in West Germany promoted a popular sort of geographical imagination of protest that situated activism squarely within West Berlin. For many young people in particular, West Berlin acted as a kind of geographical correlate to a whole host of alternative political activities that shaped and were in turn shaped by the city's physical and symbolic fabric. Activists, writes Davis, made West Berlin. West Berlin in turn made the activists. It's with this particular history in mind that I put together this rather crude um, sketch which offers something of a capsule summary of the different histories of squatting in Berlin in the past 40 years. Um, so for example, number one, we're talking about the, the early experiments with communal living that arose out of the student movement and what became known as the Extra Parliamentary Opposition, the APO, the Auster Parliamentarische Opposition. So these were some early experiments in communal living, perhaps most notoriously the Kommune Eins uh, commune in West Berlin in the late 60s, but there are a number of other examples um, uh, as well. Um, an interesting one in Hamburg is one shown in the bottom, the Ablas Gesellschaft. Um, so moving from that particular historical moment, the, the first major wave of squatting, as this chart um, uh, shows, emerged in West Berlin in the late 1970s, and it actually reached its peak between 1979 and 1981. Um, this is just an image from the Instand Besetzerpost. This was a uh, a, a news, newspaper or magazine that was produced by the squatters um, in the early 1980s. So there was a first major wave of squatting in West Berlin in the late 1970s through to around 1984. Um, and again, as this particular table shows, we now move forward to a third wave or, or third moment, if you like, um, which uh, reignited the scene um, in the late 1980s. Um, and so this was a scene that revived the scene in districts of former East Berlin after the fall of the Berlin Wall, and which culminated um, in the violent clearing of Mainzerstrasse. And here's just an image uh, of that particular uh, clearing in November 1990. And we then see the reorganization of the scene into a kind of precarious archipelago of autonomous spaces dotted across uh, a unified Berlin. So that's kind of just a, a crude uh, summary of the different histories of squatting that have emerged in Berlin over the last 40 years or so. So again, in the first instance, the emergence of communes that were associated with the student protests of the late 1960s. Uh, secondly, a first wave of squatting in West Berlin that sort of emerged fully formed in the late 1970s. And finally, a, a second major wave of squatting that, that targeted in particular um, neighborhoods in East Berlin, but was largely seen as, as a movement that, that, that cut across borders, but was also in some ways shaped by those very borders. Now, it's with this uh, crude, rough, and ready guide in mind that we see the first squat in Berlin, which began on the 4th of July, 1971. Over 300 students, activists, and youth workers occupied two floors of an abandoned factory at 13 Marianenplatz in the district of Kreuzberg, with a view to creating a center for disadvantaged and unemployed youth, and where we as a pamphlet published by the activists declared can determine for ourselves what we do in our spare time. Despite initial clashes with the police, municipal authorities eventually supported and legalized the initiative, which included plans for a metal and wood workshop, a studio, a clinic, and a theater space. And this was followed um, by further agitations in December 1971 after a teaching at the Technische Universität, the Technical University, to protest the shooting of the militant activist Georg von Rauch. And many of the activists that were involved in the creation of that earlier Kreuzberg Youth Center uh, now took the opportunity to squat in the nearby and abandoned Marta Maria House, a former residence for nuns and a part of the Batanian Hospital complex at Marianenplatz, which was built between 1845 and 1847 and which had closed down in 1970. Further police intervention, and I might add brutality notwithstanding, negotiations with municipal authorities led to official approval and legal sanction. And contracts were drawn up and squatters moved into what was now called the Georg von Rauch House. Now the history behind the founding of the Georg von Rauch House has admittedly acquired something of a mythical status within a broader history of squatting in West Berlin. 
was famously celebrated at the time by the band Tonstein Shelbin in the cult hit Das Rauchhaus Lied. Indeed, performances of various kinds were crucial to the very repertoire of political tactics which were being developed by student activists and other members of the extra-parliamentary opposition and later adopted uh, by participants in the squatting scene. So there's a kind of trafficking of ideas and tactics between student activists and early members of the squatting scene. And as a number of theater and performance historians have recently argued, the emergence of an alternative public sphere in West Germany in the late 1960s, 70s, 60s, I should say, relied in no small part on a new range of tactics whose provenance can be attributed to the performing arts themselves. So happenings, teach-ins, and street theater were an integral part of a new political pedagogy, and they spoke to the blurring of boundaries between the traditional place of theatrical performance and public space. But this production, if you like, this making of new experimental geographies was relatively short-lived, and emergency laws banning public political demonstrations prompted a move by many activists toward the creation of less exceptional spaces. So while early experiments and alternative forms of communal living, such as I've already shown, coincided really with the agitations of the late 1960s, the crackdown of the era of the, uh, the 1970s exacerbated a shift in, in the geography of activism and protest. And we see this uh, also in the relatively small number of early squats in Berlin, so ones such as associated uh, with the Batanian complex. The image, again, on the left is that hospital complex I was talking about, which remained a, a site uh, for activists uh, throughout the, the 1970s, was briefly squatted in 1973. Um, to the Tommy Weisbecker House, which was squatted in the 1973 as well and remains uh, a, a, a kind of key site within this activist geography. Um, to an old uh, um, fire station, um, the Alte Feuerwache, which was briefly squatted in 1977 before the building was demolished. So these were really early ex uh, sort of attempts to sort of um, uh, create a, a scene within uh, West Berlin and Kreuzberg in particular, but I think the political circumstances made that rather difficult. So in this context, a number of historians have sort of described, um, these are historians writing about social movements in Germany, a kind of retreat from the public sphere um, and a new preoccupation with well, what they describe as innerlichkeit, innerness, as activists looked inside and turned to the emotional geographies of everyday life as a means of achieving broad movement visions. So more intimate settings, such as cafes, pubs, alternative presses, bookstores, youth centers, uh, bike, bike repair shops, and parties offered an expanded counter-geography through which alternative support networks were created, friendships were made, and solidarity secured. And it's also worth pointing out here that this debate about what would constitute a common form of kind of political life was not limited to or reducible to these inward-looking collectives or militant forms of political extremism. It became really a key source of debate and disagreement across all branches of the left in Germany, in West Germany, and contributed to the growth of more modest forms of activism, such as citizens' initiatives, or Bürger Initiativen, as they're called, that grew to prominence in the late 1970s, and really were to provide the organizational framework for the development of the green and peace movement in West Germany. And site occupation was an important tactic adopted by these initiatives. So it's perhaps not surprising that various forms of communal living, including squatted houses, were to remain key territories within an activist community, offering a space for non-hierarchical living and open political debate. Now, while it would be misleading in this respect to suggest that the squatter movement in Berlin was untouched by disagreement, eviction, or violence, I want to underscore the degree to which squatting came to offer a very specific environment for the adaptation of existing modes of political performance. And the manipula manipulation of architecture or the built environment played a crucial role here. Many, if not most, squatters uh, took as axiomatic the active sort of materiality of the building as a condition for experimenting with new forms of collective living. And this is the point I will return to in a moment. And at the same time, of course, activism, resistance, and subversion um, still would hinge, or still did hinge, I should say, on pressing context-bound imperatives. The squatting scene which first emerged in West Berlin and Kreuzberg in the early 1970s and really flourished after 1979 was a direct consequence of a systematic or endemic housing crisis that had its origins in the circumstances of post-war reconstruction. So in order to address um, enormous housing shortages in the immediate aftermath of the war, uh, a number of major planning uh, programs were rolled out by municipal councils across West Berlin. 
And these initiatives prioritize the building of, of large-scale housing estates on the outskirts of the city, and they offer cheap rents through direct state subsidy. But an economic recession in the 1960s quickly brought an end to the building of mass modernist satellite cities. High rent costs and expensive financing prompted a re-urbanization of capital uh, um, and a new kind of spatial fix, if you like. So what happened was that to lower the costs of construction, public housing developments were transplanted back into previously multi-purpose um, historical districts such as Kreuzberg, and they replaced those districts with monofunctional modern districts. And yet this policy, this is a policy in German that's referred to as Kaltschlag or the Flächensanierung, so clear-cut or area renovation, was never really designed to be especially cost-effective, and if anything, only exacerbated an existing housing crisis through rampant speculation and local corruption. And again, these are just um, uh, uh, t uh, pages from publications produced by squatters who are often the best uh, commentators on, on corruption um, and speculation, and also charting the very dense network of connections between developers in West Berlin and various politicians. Coupled with the building of the Berlin Wall, and this is a, a map of the neighborhood of Kreuzberg, the blue dotted line shows the Berlin uh, Wall as it stood in 1961. This district, this district of Kreuzberg, really became a kind of depopulated cul-de-sac, characterized by falling housing prices, top-down planning initiatives, and a pro-development lobby preoccupied with shifting margins of profitability and revalorization. Semi-derelict housing stock from the 19th century, abandoned factory spaces, and vacant tracts of land remained underdeveloped, while low-income residents struggled to find affordable housing. Well, it's not stopped um, the American military from using those very same spaces for training uh, um, soldiers in urban combat. And this is just an image from an archive. There's a number of other images of American soldiers actually using these derelict spaces for military training. And despite attempts by local citizens uh, to promote alternative proposals for the renovation of existing spaces, um, these were more often than not rejected by the local council. An effective resistance to this new model of urban uh, redevelopment or redesign did not really take off until the late 1970s and found its most concrete expression in the so-called SO33 district of Kreuzberg, which refers to the postal code. And as the activist uh, who set in motion a new wave of squatting in Kreuzberg in the winter of 19, 1979 made clear in a widely distributed flyer, we see here, and I quote very briefly, in our districts, hundreds of apartments are empty and falling apart. Cheap apartments are demolished because landlords no longer put them up for rent. This is against the law. On the 3rd and 4th of February, the Citizens Initiative, SO36, wants to restore the lawful condition of rental accommodation. Starting at 10 o'clock, we will occupy and restore one apartment in Lübenerstrasse and another on Görlitzerstrasse. This is really the beginning of this major wave of squatting in Kreuzberg. And that without wishing to homogenize a, a variegated history of occupation, of eviction, of reoccupation, and further eviction, the period between 79 and 81 represented really the high point of squatting in Kreuzberg and West Berlin more generally. Um, eschewing public funding, squatters relied on uh, DIY maintenance and repair and quickly adopted the motto Instandsbesetzung as a slogan for the entire movement. And this term is a clever combination of two German words. The German word for maintenance, Instandsetzung, and squatting Besetzung. And uh, so again, there's sort of a, a larger history uh, of sort of DIY maintenance sort of bound up with this moment in the squatting movement, um, which obviously predates the way in which it's now mobilized within the popular media. But this is just a, a whole series of, uh, of examples of how squatters were communicating amongst each other in terms of DIY maintenance from uh, explaining to each other how to sort of reconnect the water to reconnecting electricity or in some cases even abstracting electricity and so on. And these were all um, published within um, the, the, the main squatting publication. So this whole period was a period not only of trying to occupy spaces but also the development of very basic forms of urban uh, knowledge around how to sort of renovate um, and, and maintain these kinds of spaces as well, which I find quite fascinating. And again, it predates uh, a much more recent uh, sort of DIY kind of mania, if you like. Um, by April uh, 1980, various squatter groups had even decided to come together, and they formed a Besetzerat, or a council, which was co uh, uh, sort of designed to coordinate activities across what was still a loosely connected scene animated by a diverse range of political causes. And the council adopted a wide range of tactics from grassroots campaigning and mass public demonstrations to press conferences and open house performances. But as much as such grassroots activism may have 
helped squatters to generate publicity and, and support for a new politics of housing, 1981 marked another turning point for the scene. Um, in the first instance, a violent crackdown by the police on activists who were attempting to occupy a house at 48 Frankelufer on December 12, 1980 in Kreuzberg served as a catalyst for the scene. And this really led to the explosion of occupations across Kreuzberg and elsewhere in, in, in Berlin. And at its peak on the 5th, 15th of May 1981, 168 houses were occupied in West Berlin. And from the beginning of 1979 until January 27, 1982, 239 houses have been squatted some three or four times. Um, and again, squatters were themselves um, incredibly adept at self-archiving and creating a kind of alternative map or cartography of the city in which they lived. And this is a map produced by the Instant Besetzer Post in August 1981 um, to coincide with a major uh, um, activist uh, conference slash festival. This is a map that shows not only um, occupied houses, but the other social centers, cafes, and what have you associated with the scene. On the back side of the map, we have a map of Berlin proper with um, scenes across the city. Um, and if we zoom in, we have a list of all the occupied houses um, in August 1981. So I think the point to be made here is this is a rather large um, and vibrant scene. So in this period, or by this period, I should say, the police had already been involved in over 196 actions involving houses and According to the records, 2,289 people were identified as squatters, though the number was obviously much larger than that, and part of this has to do with people not registering um, when they moved. Um, and it doesn't come out quite right on this particular, um, it usually works a bit better on a Mac, but what I've been doing over the, the, the past couple of months as well is trying to construct a database for all the different houses that were squatted in Berlin from uh, the late 60s to the present with date of occupation, date of eviction, or in some cases date of legalization, the nature of the arrests made in the houses, um, and also the original owners of those houses. And um, again, and, and, uh, and, and sort of also documenting them in terms of contemporary photographs of all the places across the city. And my main source of information for much of this has been the police who were very good at providing us with uh, press conferences in the late 70s and early 80s where they documented all of this meticulously. So I'm able to reconstruct that very basic kind of geography of squatting across Ber Berlin in this respect. So this is one of the things that I've been involved in. So by that point in May that I mentioned a, a few moments ago when it was sort of the high point in the scene, it's worth uh, uh, noting that only 77 of these houses had been successful in securing some form of contractual arrangement with local municipal authorities. Um, there was an election in Berlin in, uh, in, in May of 1981. Um, the Christian Democrats came into power, and a new hardline policy was quickly rolled out by the Berlin Senate. It vigorously policed any further attempts to squat in West Berlin. And as a result, squats unable to secure legal sanction were cleared out. And many projects that were able to guarantee long-term use of a building fell under a new state-sponsored program, which was later rep uh, also ratified by the Berlin House of Representatives. But what's interesting is under this program, houses could apply for public funds to repair and modernize their properties. And of course, for many, such a program was tantamount to a form of pacification. And recriminations quickly circulated within the movement as up to 80 houses accepted an offer for funding, even if it meant using public funds to support attempts at creating non-speculative alternative spaces. It emits widespread feelings of anger, of failure, and loss. It's perhaps not surprising that the, by the mid-1980s, the movement had lost critical momentum. The, first, the last squat without a legal contract, the iconic Kukuk, uh, uh, the, the cultural center uh, of Kreuzberg, as it was called, was cleared in July 1984. Though there were a few moments in, 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 in the years leading up to the fall of the Berlin Wall where, where different kinds of occupations of squats were attempted, um, perhaps most notably the one here, uh, this is an image of a, an open-air squat um, that, that uh, took place uh, between May and July 1988 in, in, in a patch of no man's land west of the Berlin Wall. And the story was that this was actually uh, a patch of land that was legally uh, a part of the German Democratic Republic. It actually belonged to East Germany, but in the rush to build the wall in the summer of 1961, they had kind of uh, moved the wall too far to the east. And so this land actually belonged um, to East Germany, and what was interesting about this story is that this land was going to be repatriated to the East Germans in the summer of 1988, um, but uh, squatters managed to create a kind of protest space. They were protesting the building of a highway elsewhere in Berlin and created a camp in this no man's land. And when the police came to evict them, um, they, they sort of made sort of, sort of makeshift ladders and actually climbed the Berlin Wall from the west into the east. 
where they were collected by border guards, given uh, a, a cup of tea, and then um, allowed back into West uh, Berlin. So one of the sort of kind of strange stories about the history of the Berlin Wall actually is also tied up with the history of squatting in Berlin. And it was despite this brief flourishing of, of this open air squad, it was only with the fall of the, the Berlin Wall that a second wave of squatting was able to revive the scene in districts of former East Berlin. And I'll come back to that in a moment. Now, it is worth pausing here to highlight, um, I think, how traditional accounts of the squatting movement in Berlin have tended to track the very different histories which have come to differentiate two successive generations of squatting and to which the politics of German reunification were crucial. And, and squatters themselves often um, uh, uh, refer to themselves as belonging to particular generations. And so there is a sense of kind of belonging attached to these different moments. In contrast, however, I would like to suggest that it's equally important to think about how both moments, those, these major waves, both in West Berlin and later um, uh, across Berlin, but especially in East Berlin, uh, if we take them together, they mark just the latest episode in the social life of a particular arch architectural form, um, the Berlin uh, Meets House or Tenement House. This is a building that was first conceived in the late 18th century by the Prussian King Frederick II to house soldiers and their families. Um, but the biography of this particular um, architectural artifact was itself intimately tied to successive rounds of creative destruction from at least the middle of the 19th century. And the result was the construction uh, of massive tenement blocks, as we see here, traditionally five stories high, that would extend to the very back of each lot and were only broken up by a series of tiny courtyards that could be as narrow as 15 feet, which was the minimum uh, necessary to comply with fire regulations. Poor living conditions, disease, and overcrowding were commonplace. Um, and as well, it's worth pointing out that the stigma um, surrounding crowded apartment blocks was further intensified during the war as inner courtyards quickly became death traps in times of aerial bombardment. And yet, where a first generation of post-war planners would see the demolition of these uh, uh, Mietzkasernen, so these sort of apartment blocks, a as a much-needed solution to a pressing housing crisis, squatters would later come to see the very same buildings in light of the creative possibilities they offered. So for many squatters, uh, they, they became, uh, these sites became instruments of resistance in creative reappropriation. Um, as one architectural historian ha has recently noted, a hallmark of the typical Berliner Meets House is its flexibility. And the many dilapidated and decaying um, tenements of post-war Berlin offered really the potential for squatters to cultivate new forms uh, uh, of collective living and in so doing reconcile a ruinous artifact of urban modernity with alternative expressions of human collectivity. Reappropriation in this form, as the former squatter and now architect Dougal Sheridan made clear, was itself shaped by the very basic task of improving or repairing old buildings, and it relied on a large degree of collective action and decision making. Often the material circumstances of abandoned buildings uh, meant that the rules of occupancy, DIY maintenance, and regeneration were fluid, and that the division and distribution of space and facilities was not predetermined. So squatters would respond to some of the more normative, more traditional assumptions about living in the home through the questioning of its very basic geographies. And again, this took on a number of forms and embodied a broad range of spatial practices. Perhaps at its most rudimentary level, architecture served as a guiding frame for the breakdown of the traditional public-private divide and the prior prioritization of various forms of communal space. Um, um, though Sheridan, uh, Dougal Sheridan's own experience with the squat at Brinnenstrasse 6-7, as we see here, in Prenzlauer Berg during the mid-1990s highlights actually the construction of kind of uh, multiple gradations of uh, private and public space and how they were made possible um, by the existing building structure. Here the permeability of the building was increased and re-engineered to suit the changing needs and wishes of the squatters. So walls were removed in order to increase the size of social spaces while additional stairwells were created to produce a new geography of movement to the building, now connected and held together by an interspatial network of doors, passageways, courtyards, and vestibules. In other instances, more trenchant forms of identification were mobilized with a view to creating particular spheres of identification that would encourage other forms of interaction that other deliberative spheres would constrain or censor. So, for example, we see here the former chocolate factory of the firm Greiso and Dobritz at Marianenstrasse 6 and Naunistrasse 72 in Kreuzberg, which was squatted in 1981 by a group of women who were looking for rooms where, and I quote, they could live undisturbed and meet freely with each other without the unwanted attention of men, 
and without being restricted solely to their own private apartments, unquote, or the routinizing, routinizing spatial demands of domesticity in social reproduction. Now, the renovation and modernization of the Shoko fabric, as it became known, was undertaken by the occupants and focused on a process of participatory architecture and sustainable redevelopment. And I should add here, and this is something that's certainly come up in a number of interviews I've done with squatters, is that gender and sexual politics were really a key site of disagreement and anger in many instances, a site around which solidarity is often fractured. Um, many of the women I interviewed spoke of sexual harassment and violence, and so this is one of the stories that, that does, I think, merit uh, further attention. Um, on the other hand, I think it, it's fair to say that uh, many of the people I also interviewed reflected positively on the ways in which they were able to forge an emotional field of commitment and solidarity, and they drew it, um, and if they did that, um, they did so by also uh, at the very same time drawing attention to some of the negative consequences, the very petty antagonisms, the grind, if you like, of shared living, the feelings of anger, grief, loss, betrayal, frustration, exhaustion, overwhelmness, etc. So, for example, in the words of one former squatter, life was often difficult, um, there were tears and some comrades and principals had to be left behind. The motto to live and work together led to a delicate balancing act between happiness and emotional breakdown, which was at times rather sobering. Another former squatter, Ingrid, who moved to West Berlin in the late 1980s to study, talked about the strong sense of loss that accompanied her choice to squat and abandon existing friendships and familial dependencies. Karen, who came to the scene in 1990 as a punk from the former German Democratic Republic, described in turn how the intense kind of emotional atmosphere of a squatted house was often less a product of political activism than the everyday negotiation of shifting subjectivities. And as many others have highlighted, everyday life inside a house was suffused with outside politics as sectarian political divisions were quickly mapped onto the performance of, uh, of routine daily activities. Indeed, for some, it was difficult to even imagine sharing a bathroom and a kitchen with someone who didn't think the same way as one did. But again, far more commonly, these were spaces of cooperation and collective action, where the dream uh, of self-determination and the symbiosis of living and working was fulfilled. And again, this was always, to be sure, a precarious process. It was punctuated by continuous deliberation, disagreement, and dissent. And yet to reconfigure the built environment was to make common cause and to amplify the creativity and durability of everyday living arrangements and performances. In the case, uh, 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 in the remainder, I should say, of this presentation, what I want to do is really narrow my focus and explore one particular um, case study is a house uh, sort, of, sort of often referred to as K-77. It's now a former squat and communal housing project where a host of tentative and sometimes experimental practices have been developed over the course of the last 15 years. Um, this is also um, part of the, the East German scene of which Klaus Weber would have been a part of. And so it's in this context that I, I begin to sort of uh, think about the ways in which we can kind of place him within a wider story about the history uh, of squatting. And while there were, I should also add, and remain today a number of squatted houses in East Berlin that have gained more critical attention, um, places like the Eimer, Köpi, or Tacheles, K77, I think, exemplifies a particular role that architectural experimentation has come to play in the performance of alternative political practices. And again, I want to insist that it's really out of this particular milieu um, that Klaus Weber himself emerged. Now, the fall of the Berlin Wall um, set in motion, uh, as I hinted at earlier, a new wave of squatting in East Berlin. Between December 1989 and April 1990, over 70 houses were occupied in districts such as Mitte and Prenzlauer Berg. And they were dominated, for the most part, by East German youth who had come out of the various alternative subcultures that sprung up uh, in the German Democratic Republic during the late 1980s. I should add as well, and this is something that isn't well documented, there was a squatting scene also in, in East Berlin that predates uh, this as well, um, often referred to as black uh, living Schwarzwohnen, as they would say. Um, and in a weird way, it was probably um, tacitly accepted by a state who was trying to manage a housing crisis. And so by knowing where squatters were occupying, um, the, these German police could actually map activist spaces. So there's a weird kind of um, uh, acceptance of squatting in East Berlin in particular. But anyway, um, by July 1990, the center of the scene had really shifted uh, to, to the district of Friedrichshain in East Berlin, and it now included a large number of Western activists who had been invited over by, by uh, their colleagues in the East. If the eventual police crackdown on squatters living on Mainzerstrasse, that image I showed earlier, in November 1990 served to further radicalize a new generation of squatters. For a number of students studying at the Hochschule der Künste, um, it seemed clear that new forms of practice were needed in the face of a revivified version 
of, 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 of a kind of policy uh, of prescribing and policing squats. Recalling earlier links between activist practice and the performing arts, a group of students at the Hochschule adopted a new form of site-specific practice, which as one former squatter noted, served as a catalyst uh, for the occupation of abandoned buildings. So on the 16th of December 1990, they occupied an empty apartment in Friedrichshain and turned its spaces into a temporary uh, gallery space housing the first Mainzer art exhibition. A second exhibition was held on the 25th of February 1991 in various rooms of a gallery in Kreuzberg. Further happenings and occupations ensued until the 20th of June 1992 when a number of activists dressed as doctors and nurses um, occupied one of the oldest buildings in Prenzlauer Berg, as we see here. This is number 77, Kastanien Allee, um, which would subsequently become K77. Now, the building had been empty for six years. There's an image of it um, before occupation, if you like, and as it looks um, a couple of years ago. Now, originally built in 1848, this, I think, is the oldest uh, remaining building, actually, in Prenzlauer Berg. And this three-story building predated... Um, the major plan to redevelop Berlin, which was uh, rolled out in the 1860s. And it sat, as we see here, on an unusual 10 meter by 100 meter lot. And the complex, if you like, consists of three houses separated by three interior courtyards. And the squad here, as the group would later proclaim, was, re was to respond to a medical emergency and to save, and I quote, the heart of the house, dress and heal its wounds, and fill it with life, unquote. Drawing explicit inspiration from the work of the German artist Josef Beuys, the group which took over Castanien LA uh, 77, hereafter K77, um, in 1992, deliberately recast the act of squatting as a form of continuous performance or installation art. K77 became, in the words of Boyce, a social sculpture, a location for non-speculative, self-defined communal life, work, and culture. Indeed, Boyce working methods became something of a credo or manifesto for the group of activists that had come to work and live in K77. It's perhaps not surprising that over the course of the summer of 1992, a number of varied performances, exhibitions, and installations were created. We made theater were the words of Georg, one former occupant, while another described the occupation as a theaterstück, uh, a theater piece that built on recent developments in performance art. And as Georg pointed out, um, there was no plan to begin with, a skip kind plan or set of rules governing the squat. Every space could be played with, added a, uh, another founding member of the house. Um, the possibilities were endless. For many, the, the, these were possibilities that tra transformed the building into a free space, a Freiraum, is the word that kept on cropping up in interviews, that demanded uh, creative experimentation. It was only with late summer rain and colder weather that the realities of living in a building that did not have a roof, proper windows, or water, gas, electricity set in. So experimentalism quickly shaded into pragmatism. Without any financial or legal support, producing uh, a social sculpture depended upon the constructive use of found materials, as well as improvisatory improvements to the building's existing form. At the same time, to secure more permanent residency, the group worked hard to acquire legal status, uh, which they attained, actually, in 1994. And they signed a 50-year lease uh, um, and a communal non-property-oriented solution to ownership uh, was, was resolved in this respect through the creation of a foundation through which profits were channeled into a number of socio-political projects, both in Berlin and the developing world. Uh, and many of the people involved in this house have also been involved in squatting related projects in, in the global south as well. Now the foundation running K77 was also successful in securing public funds via what's become known as the Structural Self-Help Initiative, though that's now no longer um, running um, in Berlin. But this only covered 80% of the re reconstruction costs. As a former inhabitant recalled, the remainder was made up through our own contribution. We all toiled up to 50 hours a month over three long years on the building site. And the building was in this way painstakingly renovated. Sustainable planning principles were used, recycled building materials adopted, and street, strict conservation laws closely followed. Now, over 100 people have lived um, in K77 over uh, the years since its initial reoccupation. Today, approximately 25 adults and children still live together, and they describe it as one flat across uh, six levels in three different uh, buildings. This is, again, just an image produced by them drawing attention to the kind of artistic imperatives underwriting this project. Um, these are images I took a couple of years ago. Now, again, as I said, uh, this is a complex that stretches across three buildings. 70% of the complex is now devoted to living arrangements. The other 30% include a non-profit cinema, a ceramics workshop, a studio space, a homeopathic clinic, as well as, um, as I mentioned elsewhere, one of the best um, uh, mini golf courses in 
um, in Berlin, which is actually quite fun to play. And it's, they've created this entire course on the roof of this complex. Um, that withstand, notwithstanding that, the core of the project really remains the negotiation and transgression of boundaries, political, social, and cultural. And the creation of what Matthias Hayden, one of the original occupants uh, of K77, has described as an architecture of self and coded determination that questions the right to the design and use of space. Now, for Hayden, K77 remains something of an architectural laboratory for user participation and self organization. And Hayden's own description of the project indeed highlights the role of the built form in creating new kinds of perspectives about living that are themselves dependent upon the unpredictable evolution of the spaces within the squad. So according to Hayden, and I want to quote um, at length here because I think it's quite useful, every two years the inhabitants of K77 sort out who wants to live where and in which constellation so that the usage and interpretation of available spaces is constantly renewed, and they do this to this day. In the process-oriented planning and building stage, a broad variety of forms of participation and self-organization came about. New spaces were largely laid out through flexible and self-built wall boards. Wall partitions were accordingly fitted with omissions. Light openings, room connections, and breaks in the wall were designed so they can be closed and reopened at any time, whereas overall design decisions at other moments were left to individuals. But I think what's important here is attempts to foster a sense uh, of collective property um, and economy. And this coincides, I think, with a strong commitment to overcome particular conditionings of the individual and the self, or so Hayden himself argues. Um, in the particular case of K77, it's the very performance, the very way in which architecture is performed that has become in this context a key source of inspiration for a whole host of self-organized and collective everyday practice. And again, this is precisely the milieu that Weber himself was working within um, at precisely this juncture. And I think most of the scene that K77 was attached to was a scene profoundly shaped by, by the students involved, uh, the art students that, that had come out of the Hochschule de Kunst, many of which were also involved um, in the Frei uh, or the free classes that Weber was himself involved. So K77 can therefore be seen really as a spatial manifestation of a much broader understanding of self-empowered space. Um, it was also part of uh, an informal network of, of squatted houses, all located in formal distri former districts of East Berlin, and to which the development of shared cultural spaces was a common cause. And so there are a number of houses uh, that include K77, one on Auguststrasse 10, one on Kleine Hamburgerstrasse 5, another one on Lichtenerstrasse 60, and then the Eimer, which was destroyed in 2003. Now, if the history of these houses must inevitably now be set alongside the recent and intensifying gentrification of neighborhoods in East Berlin, such as Mitte and Prenzlauer Berg, and this is, I think, is an important point to be made, I think it still carries with it a form of kind of what I would describe as architectural activism that has come to offer a critical point of purchase on the new strategies, on new strategies, if you like, for participatory architecture, community design, and spatial appropriation. And again, for uh, Matthias Hayden, the, the, the idea of seeing K77 um, as, as an emancipative social structure. And for that matter, the very practices of squatters more generally represent only one example of how an embodied and practical understanding of the built environment is really crucial to the design of potential spaces for future commons, future common spaces, if you like, in our cities. Indeed, I want to offer, by way of conclusion, a few comments on the historical significance of the squatting scene in terms of ongoing claims to the building of these alternative forms of urban living. Now, one of the things that I've really tried to do in this talk is retrace the historical development uh, uh, of the squatting scene in Berlin as a way of reflecting on the specific context out of which Klaus Weber's working practice was developed, to provide a kind of frame or a context out of which we can begin to think perhaps rather differently about his, his methods. Central to the argument of my talk is really to think about the relationship between the articulation or the expression of an alternative rights to the city and the reappropriation of the built form. So as the famous geographer David Harvey has recently reminded us, this right to the city is far more than the individual liberty to access, uh, um, to access, sorry, uh, urban resources, is a right to change ourselves by changing the city. It's more of a common rather than an individual right since this transformation inevitably depends upon the exercise of a collective power to reshape the process of urbanization. Now this very process of reshaping that Harvey has in mind has taken on a number of forms in the global north and south. And my main aim really has been to understand the practice of squatting as one important exemplar of commoning in the contemporary city. And as we face uh, the potential criminalization of squatting here in the UK alongside um, the emergence of occupation-based practices on a global scale from places like, that should be Tahrir Square, but also some will remember 
the occupation of the Wisconsin capital in February to student occupations and uh, the sort of, uh, sort of uh, explosion of the Occupy movement in recent months, um, I think these concerns remain, in my view, tellingly prescient, if not urgently so. And while these are issues that are obviously far beyond the compass of this talk, what I've tried to do is to sketch, one, to sketch one configuration of architecture and political performance, one modest oppositional geography as a way of thinking, as a way of describing, but also theorizing social change in a present tense, however difficult that may seem. A present tense that demands new forms of resilience and a present tense where we can still imagine um, and, and, and articulate the possibility of political change and where it was still possible, or I hope still possible, to forge other different spaces. So it's with all of this in mind that I would like to conclude with the observations made uh, by uh, an early interlocutor in, in this gallery's um, history, uh, French philosopher Michel Foucault, who in his final lecture course in 1984, The Courage of Truth, charted the scandalous and indeed precarious philosoph philosophical life of, of the Greek cynics. And in that lecture course, Foucault showed how the cynics lived in the midst of the world against the world, but also with the horizon of another world. In his words, they've laid down the otherness of another life, not simply as the choice of a different, happy, and sovereign life, but as the practice of an activism on the horizon, which is another world. And those are Foucault's own words. And as he concludes, and I wish to conclude with the same words, there can, only be, there can be truth only in the form of the other world and the other life. And I'll leave it with that. So thank you.